OK, I am backing up to that picture with the roots. I just want to go over this one more time just to make sure since this is the one that I had a little trouble explaining. Your maxillary molars have three roots and it's tri called trifurcated. Three for tri. The lingual one is the longest. This is the lingual root. It's the one that goes up onto the palate. So it's called lingual or palatal root. Um, it's the one that sh they say is shaped like a banana because it's kind of curvy. It is the longest. Then the distal buccal root is the shortest. So if you were looking at the root structure of these three roots, this one would be the longest. This one would be the shortest. This one would be in between. So the mesial buccal is slightly longer than the distal buccal, but it is shorter than the palatal. On the mandibular tooth, they're bifurcated or they have two roots. The mesial is longer and wider than the distal, and you can see that fairly well in this picture right here. The distal is shorter and narrower and has a longitudinal groove. So right here down the front of it, it has a deep root groove. So the first molar on the mandibular is larger than the second. So it most often has five cusps. You have your cusps from longest to shortest. Your mesial cusps are longer than your distal, cu distal cusps, and your lingual cusps are longer than your buccal cusps. So your mesial lingual is the longest, then the distal lingual, then the mesial buccal, the distal buccal, and then that little distal one. If you look at these pictures, there are grooves that separate the cusps. When we talked about that throughout our um, course here so far, that the cusps are like the mountains and you've got the valley in between. If you didn't have a groove in the middle, it would be like just one big mountain. So the, the grooves separate the cusps. This is the mesial mesial buccal cusp, this is the distal buccal cusp, and right down the middle you have what we call a mesial buccal groove. Between the distal buccal cusp and the little distal cusp, we have a distal buccal groove. So the mesial buccal groove is more toward the mesial than the distal buccal groove. So there are two grooves on the buccal side of a mandibular first molar. So the second molar, mandibular second molar, has four cusps, not five. It has two buccal, a mesial buccal and a distal buccal, and it has two lingual, a mesial lingual and a distal lingual. And here's how we've labeled it, mesial buccal, distal buccal, mesial lingual, distal lingual. And you can notice on these, the roots tend to bend toward the distal. And that's pretty typical for a, um, a molar tooth. Now, sometimes the roots will appear to go more straight down, but the overall root structure kind of sways toward the distal. Can everybody see that? Can you explain yeah. that again? I'm sorry. Okay, so you've got um, your four cusps. Your lingual cusps are more pointed and longer than your than your buccal cusp. So if you look at this picture, this is a buccal view. So in other words, we're looking straight at the side of your face. These lingual cusps are longer than the buccal. So when you're looking straight at it, this is like taking that photo where if you've got the child standing in front of you and you're standing behind them, if you are looking from the, the distal or the lingual view, um, I'm sorry, the buckle view, you're only going to see the, the bigger one. If you look from the lingual or the buckle view, you're going to see all four or both people. So this is kind of how we're looking at it. We're looking straight on at your cheek. So you, if you went eye level and you were looking straight on at the tooth, you from the buckle, you would be able to see all four cusps. Why? Because the lingual ones are taller. So you would see the shorter ones, 
and then you would see the taller ones peeking over. The mesial um, buccal cusp and the distal buccal cusp, of course, are on the buccal side. The mesial lingual and the distal lingual are on the lingual side. And the lingual ones are longer. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. So now if you were to take this tooth and flip it around so that you're looking from the lingual, you wouldn't see the buccal cusps because they're taller and the lingual cusp would be blocking the smaller buccal cusps. So now we're going to look at the occlusal surface. This is where it gets really kind of tricky. When you are looking at this and see all the different things we're going to be looking at, don't get overwhelmed. Let's start with labeling the tooth. We need to figure out which is the buccal, which is the lingual, which is the mesial, which is the distal. So when you're looking at a mandibular first molar and you're looking at the occlusal surface, the first thing you're going to look for is that little distal cusp. So these right here are your cusps. There's one, there's one, there's one, that one's one, and this one is one. This is your little distal cusp. Right? So we know if we draw a line down the center, that that cusp, where am I going with this? That cusp right here, this little distal cusp, tends to be more toward the buckle. Why does this keep flipping? Tends to be more toward the buckle. So if that's the case, that it's more toward the buckle, we know that this is the distal, this is the buckle. If this is the distal, this has to be the mesial. If this is the buckle, this has to be the lingual. So now we've labeled all four sides. Is everybody tracking on that? Okay. And this is for mandibular first molars? Yes, because it's got the five cusp, but it's got the little distal cusp. We're going to go through the other molars too, but we're starting here. So when you're looking at that picture, start with labeling the four areas. The next thing that they've done here is they've labeled the cusps. Now that we know which sides buccal, lingual, mesial, and distal, we can label the cusps. So we can label the mesial buccal cusp, the distal buccal cusp, the mesial lingual, the distal lingual, and the little distal cusp. So now we've named, labeled all of our cusps. We're going to have triangular ridges and grooves and marginal ridges and cusp ridges all coming off that same surface. They are all going to be named after their location. The names can get kind of long and can be kind of wordy, but if you just stop before you have hit the panic button, just stop and take the words apart, you will be absolutely be able to figure out what you're looking at. You do not need to memorize this. The only thing you have to memorize is how do you identify buccal, lingual, mesial, and distal? because everything else is going to fall into place from there. So now we're going to look at this buccal view of the same tooth. This is a mandibular first molar. We're looking at the buccal view. We see this little distal cusp right here. So we've got our mesial buccal, our distal buccal, and our little distal cusp. So when we're looking at the grooves, on the front of this tooth, we know we've got a mesial buccal groove closer to the mesial. We've got a distal buccal groove. It's closer to the distal. They're both on the buccal side. And then we've got our two lingual cusps. We know this is the mesial lingual one because it's on the lingual side of the tooth and it's at the mesial. We know that this is the distal lingual one because it's on the distal side of the tooth and the lingual surface. Is everybody following that so far? OK. If go ahead, if you have a question, jump in. No, I was just saying, yeah, I get it. OK, good. This is a. Um, mandibular five cusp first molar on the right side. 
Um, this that was this. This is a mandibular four cusp second molar. So second molars on the mandible have four cusps. Do we remember what happens to the occlusal surface that's easy for us to memorize? How does what do the grooves form? And you commonly see the amalgam restoration forms so a T, right? Yeah, absolutely it forms a T. So if you look at this picture, this is your second molar. The first thing we want to do is label the buccal and the lingual and the mesial and distal. Well, this is just a little bit trickier because your cusps are closer to the same size. So you're going to have to try and pick out. So on this, the mesial cusps are going to be bigger than the distal cusps. So we know that. I mean, the, yes. And the buccal are bigger than the lingual. So um, this is how we would label it then. OK, so from the buckle view, now we're looking straight on at the tooth again from the buckle view. The crown tapers from the distal contact to the CEJ more on the first than the second. What they're showing you here is if you were to um, to look at the crown taper, it tapers more. Um, let's see, more from the distal contact to the CEJ on the first than the second. So if you look at the distal contact, this is a first because we have our little distal cusp. So this is a first. This is a second. Plus they're labeled first and second. The crown taper is how the crown um slopes i guess would be the best way to put it so if you look at the crown taper and you start at the distal contact and you go down to the root you can see how that makes a pretty deep bend right there as compared to this one this one's a little more straight we kind of care about this for scaling purposes we're going to have a much deeper slope. We're going to have to angle our instrument in there a little bit better to get all the way to the CEJ on this tooth versus this tooth. Does everybody see that bend? That's called the crown taper. The mesial contour is more straight. So if you look at the mesial of these teeth, this one is more straight. Even this side has some bend, but it's more straight than this one. Everybody see that? That's going to help you a little bit um, just in confirming some of the things you've already looked at. If I were looking at these two T's, it's probably not the first thing I'd look at. I'd look at the cusp arrangement, but that's going to help confirm if you think this is the little distal cusp, and then you go, oh yeah, and there's that deep taper. So that is the distal side. So it kind of confirms a little bit for you. Your mandibular first molar is the largest tooth in the mandibular arch. That's a pretty blanket statement. And your root trunk is shorter on the first than on the second. This is called your root trunk. Your root trunk is the distance from the CEJ to where the roots split or bifurcate. That's called your root trunk. You are oftentimes going to see the root trunk when a patient has a lot of recession. So you've got your crown of your tooth, you've got your CEJ, and then you've got this root trunk area, and then your roots split into their separate roots. This root trunk area on a first molar um, is shorter than it is on this one. So in other words, the furcation comes up higher than it does on this one. Another important concept to know that we're going to continue to reinforce, you probably won't remember all these details in a term or two from now um, specifically, but the reason you will see this more is number one, patients are going to have recession on their teeth. Number two, 
these teeth can get a little bit more recession and still be OK than these teeth, because when you lose bone and gum tissue and supporting tissue and it comes down to like here, you want less furcation exposure. Those little furcations are hard to clean inside. They're hard for the patient to clean at home. They're hard for you to clean when they're sitting in your chair. So this tooth might stay healthier a little bit longer than this one when you start having periodontal issues. I have a question. Sure. So furcation is easier to get on your first mandibular molar? It's going to be um, it's you're going to get furcation exposure sooner because if you lose the bone, look at where this red line is. If you followed that straight across, if you lose that same amount of bone on this one, you can see this part of the furcation is already exposed, where on this tooth, it's still covered. We okay. want our furcations to stay filled with bone. Okay. Because bone, bone's going to support the tooth and it's also going to keep bacteria out. Does that answer your question OK? Yes, thank you. And we'll look at these again too in um, in the lab next week. I have a crown. quick question too. So sure. for the crown taper, since it's bigger on the first mandibular molar instead of the second, if we're not looking at them like side by side, how are we supposed to know? Well, you won't unless you're looking at them side by side. Okay. Crowns taper narrower from the buccal to the lingual, so the proximal surfaces are somewhat visible from the lingual. This is that same concept as we did with the roots, only now we're doing it with the crowns. The crown surface itself from the buccal to lingual are um, OK, the crown taper is narrower from the buccal to the lingual. So when you're looking at your cheek, think of the mandibular first molar in particular because it's easier. If you look at your cheek and you see those three cusps, so you've got your big mesial buccal, your big distal buccal, and your little bitty bitty distal one, that surface area right there is wider than those two cusps on the inside, the two lingual cusps. So when you rotate the tooth around and you look from the lingual view, you're going to see a little bit of that buccal view sticking out. Think of like an orange peel. If you peel an orange, the outer surface or the orange colored skin is, is bigger than the inner white skin is. So if you try to lay it flat, a lot of times you can't get it to lay flat. If you were to able to get it to lay flat, that extra orange skin would spew out longer than that white skin. Can you visualize that kind of? If you were to take a round object and you stretch it flat like that, the outer part is going to stick out now. I'm trying to think of other examples where that would be true. I'll think of some other things as we're going along. Usually the mesial, lingual, and distal lingual cusps are visible since they are longer than the buccal cusps, and we already kind of looked at that one. This is a buccal view, and so the lingual cusps are longer or taller, so they're going to stick out from the buccal view. When you go back through these PowerPoints later and and listen to the lecture and stuff, go back and just kind of stop and really look at these pictures of what they're trying to show you. This is a picture from the occlusal surface. So if you looked at the occlusal surface and you draw this line right here, you can see that the buccal side right here bulges out, especially particularly right here, bulges out farther than it does down here. See how this tapers in toward the lingual? Can everybody see that? And even on this side, it's not as much, but it still tapers narrower. So this distance across is, is longer than this distance. 
Any questions about that? No, I don't think so. OK, if if you do, like I said, when you're going through this, jot it down. The cervical ridge, the cervical ridge is a bulge that kind of forms um, on the buccal surface. It runs mesiodistally. And it's kind of the area that sticks out on a tooth and you can kind of see here. I just marked where the cervical ridge would be. This tooth is rounder or more round on the buccal than on the lingual. This is a picture or an illustration of how you can see the lingual cusps. If my eyes were looking straight across here, I would see the buccal cusps. I would see this little distal cusp, but I would also see the tips of these two. Um, on the mandibular molars, the mesial root is broader facial lingually and longer than the distal root. So overall, the mesial root is bigger than the distal root. And this is that same picture. If I'm looking from the mesial, all I see is this big mesial root. If I look from the distal, I can see the little distal root, but I can also see a little bit of the mesial root behind it. This is just like we said for the maxillary when you have the three roots. You can see the big palatal root, and from the mesial, you can only see the mesial root because the little distal roots hiding behind it. If you look from the distal, you can see the little distal root, but you can also see that big mesial root. The mesial root has a mesial and distal root depression with the distal depression being deeper and the smaller distal root has a mesial root depression, but the distal surface may or may not have one. So this is a, something we're going to have to, let me see if I have a picture, I don't. So this is something we're going to have to visualize, okay? You've got two roots and they sit like this, actually like this, okay? I'm going to turn my face. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay, here's your mesial root, here's your distal root, okay? Your mesial root has depressions on this side and this side. So we're going to treat these two roots as if they're two separate entities. Two different, they're not, um, don't think about the crown, just think about the roots right now. The mesial root has a depression here and a depression here. The distal root, which looks like this, has a depression here on the mesial side, but it may or may not have one back here, okay? So what happens is you've got a, a deeper root depression right here. You've got a deeper root depression right here. So when your roots are sitting like this, what area is that? What do we call that little triangular area? Does anybody, can you visualize this and know? What's between the roots of your teeth? The cervical area. Cervical's the gum line. What's that? Starts with an F. What's between your teeth? Furcation. The furcation. So now you've got a deep root groove here on the distal of that mesial root. You've got a deep root groove here on the mesial of the distal root. Together they make deep root grooves inside a furcation area. That's an, such an important thing to know when you're scaling and root planning on a patient that has lost the bone in the furcation area. Do you know how hard it is to get your scaler in between the roots, toward the groove, and activate movement in that little tiny area? It's really hard. So oftentimes what you'll do is use like an ultrasonic scaler, your Cavitron or your piezo tip, and you'll get in there and then you'll have to kind of rotate it so you can get into that groove to get the calculus out. Um, patients with that kind of a situation are going to use either like a proxy brush or an interdental brush or a water pick because they're never going to get things in there that they can really move around. There's not just not enough space. So this is where life gets complicated for you guys as hygienists. You're going to have that patient that has furcations on all their teeth and they hardly ever brush. 
And so every single time they come in, there's plaque, there's food debris, there's calculus, all inside those little triangles. And so now you've got to get in there and get your Cavitron and clean them out. So it makes your job a little bit more complicated, but it makes your job easier if you know that they're there. Any questions on that? So now we're going to go back to the cusps. This is where I jumped the gun and I was talking cusps when we were still on roots. Your mandibular first molars have five cusps. The mesial buccal is bigger than the is the biggest, then the mesiolingual, the distal lingual, the distal buccal, and then the distal. And these are them right here in this picture. So we've got your mesial buccal, which is your biggest. Then your mesial lingual comes next. Then your distal lingual. Then your distal buccal. And then your itty bitty distal. So they kind of form this square, like you're drawing a square. Go like that. And then you've got your last little distal. Your mandibular second molars usually have four cusps. You've got a mesial buccal, a mesial lingual, a distal lingual, and a distal buccal. So you've got these. First and second molars have three fossa. Most of your fossa have pits. This is the occlusal surface, and this where your central groove is, is called a fossa. A fossa is a depression. So where the groove is, there's a depression. I'm sorry, where the pits are, there's a depression. The pit is at the bottom of the depression. Think of like a funnel. So the funnel is the fossa. The pit is where the fluid passes through the funnel. When you take your explorer, your shepherd's hook, and you're feeling for a decay, you're going to feel in these areas here. So you're going to take your explorer and you're going to feel these pits. Oops. Oh, yeah, we didn't mean to. You have four triangular ridges um, from two, and they form two transverse ridges. So a triangular ridge comes off the cusp tip, runs to the center central groove, and then if it crosses over and connects with another triangular ridge, it's called a transverse ridge. We kind of looked at this in, in um, the first chapter. So here's a triangular ridge. This triangular ridge would have a name, and if you were naming it, the first thing you would want to do to name it would be you would want to figure out what cusp it's on because it's going to be named after its cusp. So in this one's case right here, it's on the mesial buccal cusp. So first thing we did was we looked at our tooth. We identified which side was the buccal and lingual, the mesial and the distal. Once we drew out the M, the L, the D and the B, now we can start naming things. So with these things, what cusp is this right here? Somebody jump in and tell me. Mesial buckle. Mesial buckle. And what cusp is this? Mesial lingual. Good. And this one? Distal lingual. Good. And this one? Distal buckle. Good. And this little one? Distal. Good. So now that we've labeled all of our cusps, we can, our triangular ridges are going to have the same name in them. So it's going to be the triangular ridge of the whatever cusp this is. So this case, it'll be the triangular ridge of the mesiobuccal cusp. This one's going to have a triangular ridge of the mesiolingual cusp. This one's going to have a triangular ridge of the distal lingual cusp. And this one's going to have a triangular ridge of the distal buccal cusp. So when you join these two, 
or these two you have transverse ridges. The distal, this itty bitty distal one, doesn't have a triangular ridge and it doesn't cross over to connect with any other one. So it does not have all the same features that those bigger cusps get to have. You also will have on an occlusal surface your marginal ridges. Do we remember what marginal ridges are? And posterior teeth? Anybody want to take a guess? So your marginal ridges outline the mesial and the distal of your occlusal surface. This would be your mesial marginal ridge. This would be your distal marginal ridge. Are you guys still following this? Anybody have yeah. yes? Anybody have any questions about it so far? Can you say that one more time, please? On the marginal ridges or the whole thing? Just the marginal. So marginal ridges on posterior teeth set the margins or the boundaries on the mesial and distal of the occlusal surface. So the mesial marginal ridge would set the boundary for this mesial side and the distal marginal ridge would set the boundary for the distal side. Now what's going to happen is your cusps are com have ridges coming off of them because they look like mountains. So here's a cusp, here's a cusp, here's a cusp, here's a cusp. So they have cusp ridges. Marginal ridges set the outer boundaries or the margins, just like on a typing a paper, you set your margins. They set the boundaries for the mesial side and the distal side. Then you've got your cusps on the buckle and lingual, right? Those are your four sides. Two marginal ridges and then your cusps. Your cusps are on your buckle and your lingual. So you'll have cusp ridges on those sides. Each cusp is treated like a separate mountain. So this right here, this one, this one, and this one are treated like separate mountains. So now the picture gets a little bit more complicated. We have more stuff to look at. The zigzagged groove down the middle is the central groove. Um, your mesial buckle and lingual groove join the central groove near the central fossa. So your mesial buckle and your lingual groove join at the center. So your mesial buckle and your lingual groove join toward the center. So your mesial buckle and your central groove. See that, that line that kind of forms through there? This is your central groove. And then here's your mesial buckle. So remember when we looked at the side of the tooth from straight on, we had a mesial buckle groove and a distal buckle groove. And then on the lingual, since we only have two cusps, we only have one groove that divides those two cusps. Every time you have cusps, you have a groove that divides them. That's how we got the Y shape on the mandibular second premolar. It divided the two cusps. So cusps are divided by grooves. Since we have three cusps on the buckle there, we'll have two grooves dividing those three cusps. You have a mesial buckle and a distal buckle. The mesial buckle one joins the lingual groove. So they come straight across like that. Um, your distal buckle groove separates the distal buckle and distal cusp. So if you've got the distal buckle and then you've got that itty bitty distal cusp, here's your distal buckle groove. Right here. And Again, these are all named after their location. So if I said, you, what are these two grooves names? You would know the mesial buckle one means it comes from the buckle on the buckle side toward the mesial. The distal buckle groove is on the buckle side toward the distal. Does that make sense? I know it sounds like a lot of terminology. 
they really, if you look at all of these different names, they're all named after the cusp that they're located or in the area that they're located. So there's no hidden secrets on them. I have a quick question. Yep. So um, just regarding marginal ridges, I was sort of thinking about whenever we were going over the incisors and there were marginal ridges on the linguals of those two, correct? Correct. Okay. So is it, are marginal ridges always on the mesial and distal? Yes. So on um, anterior teeth, they're going to be on the mesial and distal, but they're going to be on the lingual surface. On posterior teeth, they're going to be on the mesial and distal, but they're going to be on the occlusal surface. Okay. Anterior teeth, you know, they just have incisal edges, and those edges are pretty small. Posterior teeth have the big occlusal surfaces. Okay, so let's see. I don't even know where we are on this PowerPoint here because I did the, let's see. Oh gosh, we're only like halfway done. All right, so back to, okay. So this is a mandibular second molar. You can see that the because these grooves meet and they cross the central group, they form a T. It's known for its T shape. And this is often what you see on those teeth. The mesial and distal contact areas normally are slightly buckled to the facial lingual midline. So the lingual embrasure space is larger. So if you look at this tooth right here, this would be a mandibular second molar. The mesial and buccal contact areas are normally slightly more buccal. So if you took this tooth and you divided it right in half along the central groove here, like this, the contacts are closer to the buccal. So the tooth contacts the tooth next to it closer to the buccal, which makes this lingual space bigger. I have always found when I am scaling on molar teeth that if there's calculus underneath the contact, I can access it better here because this space is a little bit wider than what this space is. And so I always like to come in through the lingual I know it, most people intuitively want to do it from the buckle because they feel like from the buckle, you can see it better. But once you get good at your positioning and better with your instruments, being able to see is not an issue. You will always find a, a way to be able to see. It's where you can get that instrument in easier. But that's totally up to you as to how you want to do your scaling. I've just always found because this space right here is bigger that I could access that area better. But you're going to try it out by trial and error and, and kind of come up with your own ways to scale. Your maxillary first molar is the largest maxillary tooth. It has two prominent buccal cusps, a mesial buccal, which is wider and longer, and a distal buccal. Again, if you look at this tooth, you can kind of see the entire root structure curve slightly distally. Each, to, each root individually, like this root looks pretty straight, or in this case, this root looks pretty straight, but collectively they kind of tend to bend a little bit toward the distal. The longest mesiolingual cusp tip may be visible from the buccal view. So the mesial lingual cusp tip is long. And what's on the mesial lingual cusp? The little thing that projects off of it? Anybody remember its name? Cuspo caravelli. Cuspo caravelli, yep. And the buccal groove separates the mesial buccal and distal buccal cusps, but is not caries prone. So there's a, a little groove right there 
but you generally don't get caries in that groove. Grooves are always susceptible to caries, and this is one of the few that isn't. Um, all have mesial contacts at the junction of the occlusal and middle thirds. So the mesial contact is right between the, if you were to divide this crown into three places, right here at the junction between the occlusal and the middle is where the mesial contact is. And the distal contact is more cervical. So in other words, on a maxillary tooth, it's closer to the gum line on the distal. You have three roots. Um, the root trunk on the first molar is shorter than on the second molar. So remember, just like on the mandibular, the split of the furcations comes up higher on. Well, this one is on the second. Hold on a second. The root trunk on the first molar is shorter. OK. So the root trunk is shorter. I've got these backwards. This. Um, the root trunk is shorter on the first molar than on the second, and the roots diverge more on the first than the second. So diverge means they spread out. So if you look at a molar, a first molar, the roots are going to sit really far apart like this. If you look at the root structure on the second molar, the roots sit closer together. And on a third molar, they're often fused because they sit so close together. A max, on the maxillary molars, the maxillary first molar has, a, is, has the largest mesial lingual cusp. So the mesial lingual cusp is the biggest. That's easy to remember because it's got the cusp of Caravelli on it. So that makes it a little bit easier. And the distal lingual cusp is smaller than the mesial lingual. The second molar has the longest mesial lingual cusp compared to the distal lingual, which is often not present. Remember we talked about that itty bitty distal lingual cusp that may or may not be present. The longest lingual or palatal root often has a longitudinal depression on the lingual side. So here's the palatal root and it often has a depression right here. As you get really good with your scalars, you will actually be able to feel that root depression. And the distal buccal and mesial buccal roots are closer together on the first and then they are in the seconds, and that's that root divergence. They tend to be closer together. So on the previous slide, are they um, messed up? The yeah, they are. <laughs> so I'm going to have to fix that. Go by the words. The word says the root trunk on the first molar is shorter than on the second. This one, the root trunk actually looks like it's longer. I think it's because this picture, when I sh when I cut and pasted these two teeth next to each other, I this picture is actually smaller. And so if I stretch oops, the picture out, it will look different. I'll have to fix that. OK. Right. So let's look at these teeth. The occlusal cervical dimension is shorter than the facial lingual. In other words, the tooth is wider than it is tall. And you can actually visualize that. The tooth is wider than it is tall. So if we're looking at approximately, this tooth goes deeper into your mouth than it does this way. Um, from the mesial view, and we've talked about this already, you can only see the palatal root and the mesial buccal root. From the distal view, you can see all three roots. The buccal height of contour is in the cervical third, just like all teeth. And I have this one on each. And the lingual height of contour, so the buccal height of contour is in the cervical third, like all teeth. The lingual is in the middle third, and you can see that pretty easily in here. Um, 
this just keeps kind of reiterating the visibility. There's the banana root. Things to know when you're scaling. The distal root trunk near the CEJ on the maxillary for smaller near the crown may be concave. So if you're looking at a maxillary first molar, the one with your cusp of Caravelli, oops, near the CEJ here on the distal part, you may have a depression. This is the mesial view, this is the distal view you may have a de depression right here. That makes it a little more complicated because your maxillary molars, because of the parotid papilla being located right by the maxillary molars, patients tend to get more calculus buildup. And now you throw in this depression right here. These are where your Gracie scalers come in handy with that rounded toe, because oftentimes you have to angle your toe in just a little bit more. That's kind of a concept that you don't get really good at until you, till probably closer to term seven. So your mesial buccal root has mesial and distal root depressions and the distal buccal root varies. Your mesial buccal root has mesial and distal root depressions. This is your mesial buccal root and it has mesial and distal root depressions. The distal root depression is going to be in the furcation of your two buccal roots. Can you visualize that? Your first molars have four cusps plus the cusp of Carabelli most of the time. These are where the cusps are located. Your second molars have three larger cusps and one smaller cusp. Here's where they are located. And you can see that distal lingual one is really tiny. On the first molar, the distal lingual cusp is smaller, but it's not as tiny as this one. First and second have buccal lingual greater than mesial distal dimension. So in other words, they're deeper, um, buccal lingual greater than mesial distal. So they're deeper than they are wide. And you can kind of see it in these pictures. They're deeper than they are wide. So I drew the red line deeper than wide. Your second, oh, and they're rhomboid or almost square outline. So here we got, we've got this. Your distal, on your second molars, your distal lingual cusp is often quite small, so the lingual half is narrower than the buccal half. And I drew that, if you look at the buccal where the red line is and the black line, so this is considerably wider than this one. Or this, it's pretty well evenly distributed. But this one, the buccal side, is considerably wider than the lingual side because of the city bitty cusp. These are just the um, shapes. This is the heart shape I was talking about. So the maxillary second, if it only has three cusps, this one just has an itty bitty little guy right here. So they consider that just to be three cusps. And you can kind of stretch your imagination and get a heart. And these are the shapes of your mandibular molars. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, on quizzes, are you going to make it uh, like the heart shape? Will you make it more like visible to see that? Yes, um, you will definitely when you look at the molars that are on like quizzes and I know on um, I was using the dental light last night and on the dental light app, it's really they're really pretty close. And it's only if you're able to put them side by side that you can really tell the difference. But I have lots of pictures of teeth and the ones I use on quizzes where there's definitely a, a big difference. That little cusp is really small um, compared to the first molar or even compared to the other cusps. Um, if you notice on the first molar, 
this cusp is smaller, but it's still a pretty good size cusp mm -hmm. compared to that one. This one is quite a bit smaller than that one. Um, there are other features that you can use to see the difference, and that is because of that little cusp, this side right here slopes a lot more. See how it tapers more as you go into the lingual compared to this one? This one's almost more straight down, and this one goes more in. But I, the pictures I have are, you can see much better. And on this one, this is just a, kind of an odd shape but you can definitely see how much bigger this cusp is than that one okay. compared, yeah. compared to looking at this picture. There will be other clues probably too that will help you to distinguish them a little bit better. Um, transverse ridges, you can see where a transverse ridge, they come off of the triangular ridges, they cross the central groove and they form the transverse ridge. The oblique ridge runs from the distal buccal cusp to the mesiolingual, so it crosses on a diagonal or oblique direction. You've got your fossas, um, you've got your large central fossa, and you've got usually got two smaller fossas on your maxillary um, molars you have this one this one groove down here that has a little fossa and we'll take a look at those when we look at teeth again next week this is just some pictures of again a transverse ridge an oblique ridge and these are where your fossas are located this is important when you're placing sealants so when you're placing sealants you have to make sure you get sealant material all the way down this groove and make sure you get sealant material as far as this groove goes. Oftentimes students don't get that groove right there. They pour the sealant material along here, they spread it out on the table, the occlusal table, and they forget this groove right here. Is the oblique ridge distal? Distal. Like on the distal side compared to the transverse? Yes, so that it's going to run from the distal buccal cusp and the transverse is going to come off the mesial buccal. OK, thank you. And then you've got all of this complicated mess here. And on this, this picture is in your book. Right here. And I kind of tried to move some of it out into a real tooth so you could see it. When you're going through this, I want you to look at all of these things. I don't want you to memorize them. What I want you to do is identify what cusp am I on? And if I'm on this cusp, what is this triangular ridge going to be called? Go do that for each one of these different things. They are named directly after where they're located. We're going to work on that some more in class or in lab, but when you're at home reviewing the PowerPoints, pay attention to that stuff. See if you can, if, the, if it makes sense to you, okay. Even if you can't guess it, just looking at it and saying, yes, I can see why this is the, you know, triangular ridge of the distal buccal cusp. Um, contact points. This just kind of re-illustrates these. This black line shows you where the center of the tooth is. If we were to cut these teeth in half, mesial, I mean, uh, buccal and lingual, if we cut them right down the middle, you'll see the contacts are more toward the buccal. They're more on the buccal side of the tooth. I'm glad we're going through this more. Oh, we will. And then this is some real teeth kind of showing you where the buckle, where the contacts are. And again, if you divided this tooth right down the middle, you can see that it's a little more toward the buckle. These are just some different ways molars can look. Third molars do not have an occlusal table 
that looks anything like a regular tooth. So you'll know a third molar when you see it. And I've got some pictures of some third molars too that I'll show you in lab next week. But um, the third molars have just a lot of grooves. They call them accessory grooves because they don't really have like a distinct pattern. They're not the same on everything, everyone. They have their own characteristics. Um, they can even have a cusp of carabelli. Their roots are often fused. And they usually have a long trunk because the roots don't, if they do um, bifurcate or trifurcate, it's toward the end, so the trunk is really long. Thankfully, they don't usually have quite as much detail on the roots because extractions would be a lot harder if they did. These are just some other looking teeth, some, some weird ways roots can look and teeth can look. Um, third molars are oftentimes smaller and oftentimes they're out toward the buccal or the lingual. So the maxillaries a lot of times will point out toward the buccal because they've run out of space and the mandibular oftentimes will point down in toward the lingual because again as the mouth rounds out in the corners here there's no place for the tooth to come in straight. So it's got to make its way one way or another. Wisdom teeth have a goal in life and their goal in life is to always erupt. And they will keep trying until they're either they've succeeded in erupting or they're extracted. You can be you can have impacted wisdom teeth and be in your 50s and occasionally they'll still give you problems because they're still trying to erupt. Um, this flap of tissue over a semi or partially erupted wisdom tooth is called an operculum. You're going to see this all the time in clinic because we have patients that their wisdom teeth don't have space to come in and they haven't had regular dental care, so they haven't had a chance to get them extracted. So you'll see this where the cusps have come through the tissue, but that's as far as they can go because they've run out of space. This flap of tissue is called an operculum. And if it becomes traumatized, like when you're chewing, if you bite on that and it gets swollen and inflamed or infected, it's called pericornitis. And we talk more about pericornitis in perio. So third molars, again, this is just the same thing. They vary in size and length and shape, and that's it. We are going to go over all of this stuff again, but for what I want you to do, because we're going to do this Wednesday and Thursday will be the quiz. What I want you to do in the meantime is I want you to go through the PowerPoint again. Listen to the lecture, go through the PowerPoint. Take a good close look at those pictures. Make sure you can identify the grooves, the fossas. Try to make sense of the names of things. Try practicing labeling buccal, lingual, mesial, distal. There are um, all kinds of pictures on the internet. Um, you have pictures in your book, lots of pictures in your book. Um, I put some exercises or some an activity on, oh, it's actually an assignment, on um, Canvas. I would say even if you're not ready to do the assignment for a grade, Look at those pictures and see, start thinking about what, what could this be? So that you has, can start to identify by name, how did I know this is the buccal? How did I know that's the lingual, that's the mesial, that's the distal? And if so, what tooth does that make it? Is that you assignment know? six? Uh, yes, it should be assignment six. Okay, it's still locked. It's still locked, okay. So I'll unlock it now and then you'll have it available. Um, so like I said, even if you're not ready to answer it and turn it in yet, go through the pictures and start looking at it and seeing if you can identify those things. Did I've got a post, Sorry. No, go ahead. Um, did you post Tuesday's lecture? Cause I couldn't find it. I tried to post it last night while I was at on campus and or yesterday while I was on campus and I couldn't get the internet to 
download it fast enough. And oh, it kept, okay. And it kept stopping. So I'm going to do that right now, too, because hopefully okay. my internet's faster um, to get it posted. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And, and this, this lecture will be ready like in a few hours. So if it's ready before I go to clinic, I will um, I will post it. Otherwise, I'll try to do it during clinic, but I'm it's, you know, it just depends what's going on there. Um, so I will have it up as soon as possible. Though. And then I know you said that um, you had like other worksheets and stuff for different things. Do you have any additional worksheets that would be good practice for the grooves and fosses and just occlusal surfaces of the molars? I have um, I have some. Um, let me see what else I've got, and I'll okay. put them up there. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? If you think of anything, jot it down on a piece of paper and bring it with you. On what you can email me, and I can answer it. If I can answer through email, I will do that. Otherwise, we can talk about these things in class because chances are if you have questions, other people have questions too. And sometimes it just takes that first person to open the door for everybody else to kind of say, yeah, I didn't get that either. So don't hesitate. Anybody else have any questions? If not, have a good day. Thank you, you too. Have you a nice too. holiday weekend. You have a good day. Stay safe. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye.